I wanted to give some advice early on in your career about how you actually go about building and thinking about that research agenda. So first a caveat, uh, where is my perspective coming from? Uh, I'm a fourth year assistant professor who just submitted their mid-tenure review packet. Uh, my trajectory uh, is that I did an econ PhD at Tulane. I did not go on the market during the PhD. I found a postdoc opportunity and went straight into the postdoc after the fifth year of my PhD. I did the postdoc at Berkeley Haas, wrote a new job market paper during that postdoc and then went on the market with that paper. And now I'm an assistant professor at Kellogg at Northwestern. So in terms of building a research agenda, ideally your agenda will be guided by an overarching research question. It's also common to see two strands uh, or overarching questions, even sometimes in, in tenure packets, or if, as in Janet's case, you still you have one up until you come up for tenure, and then maybe you branch out and, and explore a second stream. And then your papers will address sub-questions underneath that umbrella question that are going to answer part of that broad question. So often within that broad question, you have different uh, sub-questions that come up, and those will become the papers in your research agenda. Now, of course, the sub-questions often come before you articulate what the overarching research question is, uh, but once you have multiple ideas or projects, it's good to start asking if they're getting at different pieces of an overarching research question. So a few tips on building a research agenda. My first tip is to find a research question that you're super curious and excited about and interested in finding answers to. Research can be a slog, so you want something that every phrase it does keeps you up at night. I'll phrase the other side of it, which you wake up in the morning excited to get out of bed and work on. My second tip is sometimes PhD students try to over-optimize and really pick their research agenda based on what they think will, say, play best in the profession. My advice is to not try to over-optimize and not choose your research question based on criteria like, is this a hot topic right now? which schools would hire me based on this research question, and finally, some may disagree on this with me on this, but is this finance, I think is not a useful guiding question. As Effie was saying, you need an important underlying economic question, but uh, thinking, well, is this a traditional question within finance, I think is not the right criteria to uh, base your agenda on. And then third, if you follow the first tip, once you get started on one paper and get feedback on it, uh, the idea, so I'm going to emphasize the importance of getting feedback. Once you start getting feedback on that first uh, paper, the ideas for future papers will come. Because some question will come up as you're working on that first project that you think, oh, no one's really answered this question in the literature. Okay, now I have a second question to look at. Uh, so you probably all know some people, maybe some of you are this person who had tons of ideas in grad school. They were the idea people. I was not an idea person. So how did I develop the agenda that I'll talk a little more about? Well, it was that I just had a first question. I saw one thing that piqued my interest I thought was interesting. And then as I went about answering that research question, then you start to realize, oh, there's this other question that people haven't answered that's, that's related under the same broad uh, research agenda. So to give you an example of, uh, from my own research agenda, what's my overarching research question? Well, according to, I dug up my research statement from when I was on the job market. So according to job market candidate Sean, the question was, what are the impacts of financial technology, entrepreneurs' access to finance, and households' access to financial services? Now, at that point, I hadn't yet articulated what was the important underlying economic question, which, as FBA emphasized, is important. So, according to my mid-tenure review packet that I recently turned in, the question is, how does technology reduce frictions in payments markets and consumer financial markets, and what are the effects of reducing these frictions on households and small firms in emerging economies? And then within that piece of consumer financial markets, I have a set of papers on frictions that prevent households from saving, and another set of papers on credit market frictions. So as you can see, it's really the same agenda as it was when I was on the market, but uh, it has a different wording, and in particular, articulating more what the underlying economics uh, behind the question are. To give you an example also, okay, now you've heard, to continue with the example, you've heard what the overall uh, research question is, so what are the sub-questions, what are the papers within that umbrella research question? So I mentioned both payments markets and consumer financial markets. So within payments markets, I've asked, uh, do coordination failures constrain financial technology adoption? That was my job market paper. I've asked, why do small firms fail to adopt new profitable opportunities? 
in particular within the context of uh, small firms who are using a fintech payments product. And I've asked how do firms respond to a change in the cost of depositing cash at banks. Moving to the savings constraints side, I've asked how do debit cards reduce saving frictions, and in particular the frictions that we were looking at in those papers were transaction costs and a lack of trust in banks, and then how do they, by reducing those frictions, enable, uh, enable people to save more. And I've also looked at whether a lottery-based incentive leads unbanked households to open bank accounts and then save in those bank accounts even after you remove this temporary lottery incentive. And then on the side of credit markets, I've looked at how do inaccurate priors about the distribution of interest rates affect search and can technology correct priors and increase search in consumer credit markets. I've looked at how does, or I am looking at uh, in an ongoing project, how randomized competition affects the credit card terms that banks offer, uh, including the interest rate, uh, other fees, and non-monetary characteristics of the credit cards. And then finally, also in an ongoing project, I'm looking at do government guaranteed loans enable firms to maintain jobs and survive during cash flow shocks? So that's just to give you a sense of what I mean when I say, okay, there's an umbrella research question that's, that's your research agenda, and then you have sub-questions, which are the individual papers that you're working on within that research agenda. Next, you're going to have to sell your research agenda. So a couple tips on selling your research agenda. Well, if you follow tip number one, you're already excited about your research agenda. But on the job market, you're going to need to convince others why they should also be excited about your research agenda. Or at least, if they're not personally excited about it, why it's an interesting and important question to study. A tip on this that's also a, a, a bit more in the nitty gritty for those of you preparing for the job market right now, I think for any paper within your research agenda, you should be able to describe what you do and what is the research question, what you find, why it's important, and how you do it, which is identification strategy, data. Uh, this is some advice I got before the market. And in particular, I recommend that when you're preparing that first round interview spiel, your kind of four to five minute initial elevator pitch uh, addresses these four points. And then you also, of course, addressing, you know, the first point is even the mini, first part of the elevator pitch, and then, uh, and then say the first two is the first couple of minutes of that, of that elevator pitch. So that way, within the first four to five minutes, if you haven't gotten interrupted with questions, you've already covered the really important pieces of your paper. Some additional advice moving a bit beyond the uh, research agenda. What are some useful traits, I think, uh, that are useful to have as you develop your research career? One is curiosity, kind of a nagging desire to learn about the world and the topic that interests you, and, and that's thus your research agenda. Uh, resilience, so there are a lot of setbacks in research. Keep pushing through those setbacks. Uh, expect rejections. Don't be phased by re rejections. A useful piece of advice I got from an advisor was once you submit your job market paper after the market, expect it to get rejected the first place you submit it. And I've actually put this into practice even recently. I got an email that I saw was a decision letter from the, from the editor, and I already told my partner, oh, I just got a rejection. I hadn't even opened the email yet. I was preparing myself, and I even waited. I didn't open the email right away. I kind of told myself, oh, paper got rejected. Uh, and so you kind of then, by the time you actually open it, if it is rejected, you're, um, you know, you're, you're ready for that. You don't have that big heart sink. Uh, in that case, I was pleasantly surprised uh, with that particular uh, editor letter. And then uh, also the need to understand. So I, I think a lot of researchers actually don't have this trait, but it's a trait that you can develop. And what I mean by the need to understand is that if you don't understand something, a result, a method, don't just move on from that and say, oh, that's fine. I don't need to really understand this, especially if it's a weird result that comes out of, your, out of some analysis you did. Often the unexpected and weird results are the most interesting in the sense that they, they lead us to learn something about the world that we, that we weren't expecting or hypothesizing going in. So keep digging until you do understand it. Also, uh, following up on what Amit said, get broad feedback. Talk to many people about your research agenda and job market paper to get feedback. Sometimes I think PhD students are nervous about people stealing their idea, but that's generally misguided. Uh, going out and uh, being worried about that is going to prevent you from getting feedback, and, and feedback broadly is, is really going to improve your, your research. And often people outside your specific subfield have distinct and very useful perspectives. So one thing I did at Berkeley once I had 
kind of a, an initial slide deck for my job market paper was I reached out broadly people across POS, uh, the economics department, the agricultural economics department, and got, and got their feedback because often you hear a perspective from outside your subfield that you're gonna, that prepares you for the market in the sense that, oh, that's a question that maybe within my subfield people wouldn't have asked, but when you're actually out on the job market, there's gonna be people uh, from across different fields in, in finance. Some additional advice for empiricists. Uh, take replication seriously from the beginning. Journals are increasingly requiring data and code to be submitted, and uh, they're also ensuring, in, some, in the case of some journals, I think this is the direction that we're going to go for, for all journals in the future, they're uh, ensuring it runs and reproduces the results that are in your paper. So from personal experience, it'll save you months of time after your paper is accepted. If you take that very seriously from the beginning, think about having a replication package from the beginning, and uh, making sure there's, uh, when your paper is kind of in a state of being a paper, that there's scripts where you can run one and it's going to run all the analysis and produce all the results in your paper. Follow best practices when coding. Uh, I've written uh, some, some guides on this for R, Stata, and Python. So, of course, take any, any of it you want and discard the rest, but, but that was mostly for myself and, and working with co-authors and research assistants, but hopefully it can be useful as a public good as well. And then finally, implement systems with yourself, your co-authors, and your research assistants. Uh, I've also uh, written down my own systems if, in case they're useful for anyone else. And I'm happy to chat more if people have questions.